Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our expert talk on day two of Form Next 2021. Today, we will be talking about uh, a topic which is called building an architecture with 3D printing. And the question is, is it just a media hype or the coming reality? And my guests here on stage are true experts, which I would like to introduce to you first. So to start with, welcome here on stage, um, Martin Madegold uh, of company Imagine Computation. Welcome. Uh, beside him, welcome uh, Professor Oliver Tessmann of Technical University Darmstadt here in Germany. Uh, beside him, welcome to you uh, as well, Professor Ulrich Knag also of Technical University Darmstadt. And last but not least, welcome to you as well, Nadja Gudelier. Technical University in Darmstadt seems to be a good place to make research and work on architecture and building, right? Because everybody, almost everybody, is from Technical University in Darmstadt. So what are the topics that you are dealing with uh, at the moment? And what um, are the trends that we see here on Form Next? Maybe to start with you. Topics we are dealing with? Yeah. Um, now yeah the first thing is you need to transfer technology from other industries in our construction environment. There are some, say, technical aspects, there are some legal aspects, but there are also a lot of design questions, functionality design, which is to be identified. That's where we feel very comfortable. This is where we feel like, okay, we see opportunities to develop certain design, design directions to come to a technical solution. That's, um, that's one thing. And the other thing is, uh, this show obviously, this um, trade fair is obviously a place where you find all these technologies and you find these partners which are opportunities to join our construction. When we maybe later in the discussion go into details about where we see the value for our construction environment, where we, where we could um, think about craftsmanship, that's something which may go deeper in the following part of the discussion. Okay, Oliver. Last time at, uh, at Form Next, at the physical Form Next in 2019, we met and we discussed about um, the trends at that time. And I had the impression that uh, at Form Next 2019, um, the examples here on, on, on the Form Next about building and architecture were very few. This year, I have the impression that every second booth is dealing with <laughs> architecture and building. At least that's my impression. Do you share this uh, impression? Has it increased in the meantime? Absolutely, yeah. So um, we have uh, the great opportunity to show some uh, pieces of uh, architecture being 3D printed as an exhibition here on the fair. Uh, but we do not only see architectural parts on that exhibition, but all over uh, the whole fair hall. So we see that topic uh, jumps from research at universities into practice. Uh, we see first buildings being 3D printed, which if you would have asked me, may maybe two years ago I said that's almost impossible. And now we see multifamily houses being 3D printed. So uh, the development is super fast um, and we see that yeah, architectural functions and architectural materials are processed uh, with and through 3D printing. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I was wondering uh, when preparing this show, uh, I was wondering uh, what kind of market is the building and architecture market? Because if we look into the industries, for example, automotive or medical uh, or sports articles, uh, yeah, this, the, the, these are innovative um, fresh industries, uh, but to my understanding, the building uh, industry, we, we, we can't even call it industry because it is not. Building sector is not an industrialized sector, right? So how do those two things fit together, Martin? Well, uh, people say that the, industrial, uh, that the architectural field is not very highly digitalized, and, but we are, doing, we are currently seeing a jump we're jumping over certain things. We're going from this 2D craftsman drawings down to 3D printed parts in one session. So there's a rapid change happening in the, uh, in the industry right now. Um, what we see in 3D printing is that uh, size, or, or in architecture generally, is that size matters a lot. So uh, where 3D printing was not very interesting at the time when the components were really little. Now you can see that all the the manufacturers are producing larger parts and this is uh, becoming more and more interesting. And also the mat materiality that we are printing now is different a little bit in, in, 
in the architectural field than it is here when you at the form next where you can see a lot of component based elements. We are working with concrete, we're working with uh, with um, WAM, um, wire arc manufacturing, so higher resolutions and not so much precision. So it's necessary to be to be working in the architectural field. Mm -hmm. But how do you come in touch with your, let's say, final customers? Because uh, in the industries, it's rather easy because you just need to check uh, <laughs> the list of companies dealing with the topic. But in the, in, in the building sector, it's, it's not like that, right? No, it's not like that. But what you have is, uh, in, or in the architectural field, the building sector, what you have is you have no large serial production, or not at least with the, in the high class architecture. Everybody would like to have a unique building. Everybody would like to have something specially made for him. So an architects are designing these, they're making design efforts. So it's a, it's a craftsmanship on the one side and it's art on the other side. So it's, it's somewhere in between. So um, what we are dealing with is in many cases very low, uh, uh, low quantities of parts that are individualized. And that is actually what 3D printing is all about. You know, you can produce uh, complex parts in a, a small uh, serial production, mm -hmm. and uh, you're getting gains from that. Mm -hmm. Not yet. I, I, um, uh, the big difference between, um, let's say, those industrial uh, parts and, and and the building or architecture sector is is um, the size, as as, as your colleague said. Um, what? Um, what impact does that have on the technologies? Is the technology for the building sector easier to build up, or um, does it only look simpler? Uh, on the contrary, I would say it's slightly more complicated. Um, one maybe important thing is that if you look at the machines that are used in st uh, the 3D printing industry elsewhere, um, it's a certain series of model, and then when you came up into architecture and construction, you have to change it. You have to resort to a whole set of different machines. So in a sense, it's difficult because you have to, it's maybe the case in every industry when you start with a new process, but you have to redesign the machine you're using. So that's the first part. The other part is that obviously you deal with different materials and you deal with very different objects. So there is indeed a, a scale jump to be made, but we've seen beautiful parts there. So there's also a different logic in thinking about the building itself, that it's not, as you do with concrete, a big thing that you will cast at once, but maybe it's a different logic of um, what components you print, maybe components you don't print, and then you put them together. So there's, yeah, again, an entire logic in machine in building that you might want to reinvent. Got you. Um, what I'm wondering about also is um, the process itself, because um, in the industry you have a controlled uh, surrounding. You have a dedicated room where your 3D printer is located. Uh, you have a nice and uh, clean setup. You have maybe an operator uh, wearing um, um, clean uh, clothes and all that stuff. In the building sector, this is the co the absolutely contrary to that. Uh, so you have really rough conditions. You are in the outside. You have to move the machines to the place where the building is erased. So what does that uh, or what is the influence on the machines? Yeah, you're, um, you're in general right. By construction sites, uh, they're outside. Uh, we built in winter. So um, that's a quality control. That's an aspect. But um, that's what this craftsmanship, as we name it, is also used to. And why, what I think is interesting with this uh, 3D printing, it's um, the opportunity to get craftsmanship digital. And um, this is where, say, Parts can be individualized, then uh, brought to place, and then being installed. There will still be um, a part of installation. There will also be a combination of the 3D printed part, the sample we see there, um, 3D um, printed parts, and the standard, the common parts from system supplies. So there will be a combination. But it delivers the opportunity to get craftsmanship into a digital setup. That's the one aspect, technically speaking. But it's also, say, a financial aspect. Our industry, as you said, uh, it's super fractured. It's super small companies. A middle-sized company in our industry is, in other industries, a small one. And in that relation, um, the costs of these 3D printing processes versus larger production for cars or whatever um, are lower. So there's a good potential situation of having this industry really, or this building industry really adapting this 3D printing. Downside? 
We are still in the early phase of this. We see a lot of things developing, but we are still in the early phase. And the uh, construction industry is um, talking about products lasting 100 years. And if you invest your total money for your private house and you want to make sure this stays for your life and the life of your kids, uh, you want to make sure this really works. And that's something where our industry, always being blamed to be so slow, <laughs> is actually conservative. And it has to be conservative. Because there has to be, say, a certain knowledge about how far can we go with this technology. We're not talking about a piece which, if it breaks, just breaks. We talk about pieces, if they break, they kill people. So that's a part which is, say, deeply to be considered for further research. And there's a lot of research ongoing. So in that respect, um, Oliver, we are pretty much running, say, at the front end. And we have ideas. And we're going to see the one-offs and the mock-ups and the early birds. But uh, they say the next generation of research is necessary to really dig into um, methodologies to evaluate. And you are not only substituting the existing things with 3D printed things, but you're inventing new ideas of combining, for example, components um, or materials. And you have brought uh, an example, um, which is here on the table. Um, Martin, let us know what it is and why you produce that in a, print, a 3D printing process and not in a conventional way. Okay, so this is a 3D printed knot for uh, the connection of four uh, standardized uh, aluminum facade beams. And there are several reasons why we 3D printed this. Um, one of them is the complexity of how it would look like if you did the conventional way. Then you would have to cut three, uh, four sections of a, of a profile together. You have to weld it. You have to have a skilled craftsman who's doing that. And you then would need to, uh, you would run into many, many problems, thermal expansion. And, and uh, you would not have such a clean look as you would have here. You can see you would have welded rounds. You would have um, not these sharp edges that you know from 3D printing. Also, you can define the detailing in a very different way. So it is much easier to assemble. So even the component is relatively expensive. What you can say is that um, the amount it's needed to actually assemble the complete unit is massively reduced. And that is actually the benefit that you're having in the building industry, is that you can, with these 3D components, in the complete process of building and pre-assembling and all that, you can save a lot of money and time, or time and money, the way, <laughs> depending on how you do it. Um, also, you have some benefits like, in, this is a facade element, so there's rain coming and all that, and, and if you have, it's potentially dangerous to get water into the building. So if you have a 3D printed component, these, this is just watertight, there's nothing coming in there. So you, you, you can handle all this. You can see, if you look closely, you can see that you're also um, smoothing out some geometric complexity uh, through the 3D printing, something that you would see and had to manually change. So I'm a fan of these kind of things. Um, it sounds like, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it has a high potential. And um, what you're doing is you're, actually, you're transferring the complexity of a, of a joint from the craftsman, from the, from the Werkstatt, from the, um, from the workshop, down to the uh, to the cat play uh, cat system, and then there is many opportunities to start automating these kind of processes. Things that would not be possible later on in work, uh, or are not as easily possible in the workshop. Mm -hmm. Oliver, uh, whom do those manufacturers, all of those those inventors of such technologies, have to contact um, in, in in the workflow? Because would you talk to an architect? to bring this idea into play or to the construction company uh, who, is, who is doing the overall project? Who is the contact person? Or better said, where is the business case? Where do I have to go to sell these technologies? Yeah, I think there are, there are different ways to reach your goal. Um, obviously, such a thing fits best into a facade system. Uh, so you would most probably talk to the company that produces those kind of facades. At the same time, you have to allow architects to design those kind of things. So that what they need is digital design tools that help them to, let's say, generate 
geometry and the complexity of these geometries and allow architects also to explore what they can design with it. So it needs both. You need to talk to the design and architecture community, but then you also have to make sure that uh, the data that is produced there is translated into fabrication data, which then is used to materialize. Yeah? So what we are experiencing right now is what has been separated for 500 years since Renaissance times, the planning of architecture, making drawings, and the, the actual building of buildings, that has been separated, but through digital fabrication, this is growing together. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you have to talk to everybody who's involved in that design to production process. What I learned a lot here at Form Next and uh, in the recent year was that w w the industries need to go through a m change of mind uh, in the, in the uh, erection of the project from the very beginning. So, uh, the design really needs to be made for AM, for additive manufacturing. Is that true in the, in the building sector and the architectural sector as well? Both, both worlds. Uh, it, as um, Martin said, uh, we see that shift from uh, 2D to 3D to full digital uh, design. So that shift is kind of uh, happening. Um, you, you, you also can... How to address it? Um, we're not going to see every construction being entirely digital pre-manufactured. We're going to see, we're going to see uh, components being standard. We're going to see the complex part being individualized. And this uh, process needs this design process. Uh, the engineers need to be able to design it, uh, the architects need, and then manufacturers need to be able to do it. And the question is, um, and that's something which we are still say, that's always an, an, a question when we start research, who to target to really make it. So who's going to be the distributor? And yes, companies here produce these machines, make these machines, supply these machines, but then someone needs to use that. And that's where I still believe, or very much believe, that this craftsmanship is really the point where this kind of things uh, will happen. Another aspect, um, we're going to see this mainly in, say, special and individual projects, um, standard projects, standard raw houses that will take a longer time to see more of the 3D printing components because there you use a lot more of standard, uh, standard components. So in that respect, it's, an, it's uh, in the beginning a small market, but as we see this, uh, this technology, I'm now observing this since 10, 10 years, how fast it developed and how fast the, the price is reduced, there's a good opportunity to see in, what, five, 10 years time, this in a broader range. Talking about prices and talking about costs, everybody knows that the construction segment is under enormous cost pressure, right? Uh, so the question is, is this technology that we're seeing here on Form Next or in your laboratories, is that an affordable technology or is it still in a stage where we need to wait until the cost for the process are driven down? Nadia. Uh, so obviously, uh, if you start with something new, the cost eventually dies down a little. But there is something we have been dancing around for a little while, which is 3D printing for the construction industry is actually extremely versatile. And if you look at business models for f um, people who actually print elements for the building industry, which are probably the people you would need to talk to if you want to realize something like that, you have people that print a lot of basic concrete. It's not a critic, it's just uh, usual concrete with very thick layers, very fast for very large pieces. And then we have people who print super high performance concrete with very thin layers and a very high precision. Obviously, these are two very different uh, things. These are two very different costs in the sense that one might be addressed towards high-end design products and the other one might be targeting uh, massive housing printing. And so in that sense, the, uh, the affordability question also highly depends on what is it you actually want to 3D print and how you want to achieve it, on top of the fact that eventually the materials and the machines are going to cost less and eventually the buildings themselves also. Okay. One simple question I have, if I, for example, would have to take the decision to build my own private house for my family, and, you know, um, very few of us do pay this 
with the money in, in the pocket. So you go to your bank and ask for a loan uh, and they have a look at the house project and say, okay, is it a wooden house? Is it a stone house? No, oh, it's a 3D printed house. What will the bankers say? <laughs> Are they already adapted to the idea of printing houses or do, do they think I'm mad, Ulrich? <laughs> First thing is uh, they think you're mad. Second thing is, hey, this is super cool. <laughs> And then they, But you then, won't get the money and, anyway. And, and, then, and then, no, then they change your rate because you take the risk. Uh, that that's simple. Um, it depends on what you use. Huh? The concrete part you're, you're, you you were talking about. Um, we see now industry really adapting to this. We see industry now really getting into that market with, say, a certain performance, a certain quality. That's uh, that's a good way. But and that's what Oliver and um, Martin were addressing as well. It's not about replacing a technology. It's about using this technology where it makes sense. So the knot he's showing, it's a super complex knot. To make this in a standard system, wow, that costs a fortune. This knot may be more expensive, but when you take it in total, you earn because you make the whole thing simpler. And that's the idea of uh, 3D printing. This is where we say, where, where we feel like this is the direction we need to go. It's not about replacing something. It's about combining questions, technology to you, um, combining questions and then using this technology to solve these questions. Mm -hmm. So um, if you would go for your private house, um, it's not going to be entirely printed. Parts of it are going to be printed okay. with a higher loan. So there's another thing I'm curious about, and, and having scientists here on stage, I will take the opportunity to ask those things. Um, uh, how about sustainability? Is 3D printed building more sustainable than a standard and traditionally built um, building? Oliver? Well, it depends. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, the lawyer's answer. <laughs> <laughs> to, to follow up what Ulrich just said, um, if we consider 3D printing t technologies as replacing what we did since 100 years, then probably it's not sustainable. But what we experience today is that um, the, the CO2 emissions of the construction industry become a public issue. Yeah, we talk about uh, traveling, airplanes, and all these things. If you look at pouring concrete and how much material is used to build buildings, then um, 3D printing could change things here. Yeah? Um, a lot of constructions look the way they look because they are easy to fabricate in that way. Nobody thought about reducing the amount of concrete or steel. This will become an issue in the next years. Yeah. And we all know that 3D printing allows us to place material where we really need it. And the another thing in construction is that we can integrate functions. So we hopefully have mono material building parts that do a lot of different jobs, like load bearing, but also regulating the climate, um, yeah, create openings uh, and closing. So, um, we need to rethink the way we build. Yeah. Got you. The, uh, Martin. One other aspect that is potentially there is to use these, uh, to use it in recycling processes. So if you talk about taking a wooden beam from an bu existing building and trying to make it fit somewhere else, you would need to have some kind of adaption to it. And this adaption needs to be produced somehow. And 3D printing can play a role in that, in that matter, I believe. And um, I also would agree with the, with the fact that um, it's about the, the complete system you see. It's CO2 emissions is a, is, a, is a difficult issue because you can say, okay, we're printing 3D metal that is out of aluminum. You can say, okay, the aluminum is actually bad material, but, you in, but in other cases, uh, it's, if, you, if you use recycled aluminum, it's a to totally different story. Or if you use... Um, if you use much less than you would need in a conventional way, it's also an, um, a different story. So you have to see the overall uh, calculation of the CO2 emissions. And also the question is, what material is best where? So um, what you can say about the, the, the potential of 3D printing is that you just reduce the amount of material you need because you can just use it where you need it. And this is overall... Uh, we're talking about huge amounts of material in, that are built in a building. I think there was this high rise in Frankfurt. It was several thousand tons of aluminum. And um, so we're talking in this kind of category. So if you just reduce the amount that you're using uh, by a very uh, small percentage, 
you're still um, making huge gains. And that is, if you think about concrete, if you think about 3D printing concrete and just reducing the amount of uh, yeah, the, 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 the floors, the way they just, I don't know, by 50%, you, it's, a, it's a huge impact for the building industry or and the sustainability. Okay. Um, one last question. Um, I'm curious about um, the, the, the market and, and the players in the market. Do they approach you and ask for new ideas? Um, is, it, is it something that the customers, the potential customers, are asking you uh, to provide information about new technologies? Or is it the other way around? Do you need to go out and inform them and, and push them a little bit into this direction of 3D printing? What is this market about? Um, I would say, from my experience, um, as part of a 3D printing company, that um, clients are actually very demanding. I mean, we've seen, it's a French company, but we've seen large construction companies from all over France come over and start asking about the design systems. We've seen a lot of clients, individual clients, coming and saying, I want my house to be 3D printed. A few architects as well were interested in the complexity, the form of complexity you can achieve. But in past, the past few years, there's actually been a growing demand from the industry directly. Then someone can probably compete from the university point of view. Mm. You have to push a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, bit to be honest, you a have to push bit. a little bit. <laughs> right? the, the construction industry is very conservative, as we already mentioned. And uh, these are very new ideas. And, uh, but if you can convince them with price and ease of use and all these things, then there, there is a way. So I, I think this is, um, yeah, that there's a large market, especially large companies in that field that are producing things. They are, they are always, um, change comes not as quickly, but, but it's, it's happening. And where are the trend drivers? Here in Europe or the US or Asia, Oliver? All over. Where's Europe. the place to be uh, when <laughs> building in, in buildings and architecture and in, in, in 3D printing? Is it here in Europe, hopefully? Our, our lovely colleague Chris Borg made a global map yes. where he pinned all the uh, research but also practice teams mm. that push AM and 3D printing. And it's a global phenomenon. Huh? We see it in Asia, we see a lot going on in Europe currently, but also in the US. Um, so I, I couldn't say that there's one place to go. But today, there is one place to go, and it is Form Next. Thank you for being here with me. It was a great pleasure uh, learning about the building and architecture scene and uh, the great opportunities with 3D printing. Thanks a lot for being here and thank you for watching. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.